pleasure to listen to Peter Davis. Um, I remember three years ago we were in Abu Dhabi together. Uh, you remember Dr. Junai uh, had a very good time together in Abu Dhabi. So in this second lecture, I will talk about delivery room handling. And <clears throat> again, my my outline is probably too busy, but I will I will not have time to cover all these aspects in detail, but uh, some of them um, during the next 30 minutes or so. So um, <clears throat> when we talk about uh, delivery room management, we, we often talk about the golden minute or the golden minutes. What we're doing in the delivery room um, is so important for the, for the outcome of the baby. And I have uh, put some of the <clears throat> therapies and factors that influence the baby's outcome here. But of course, also antenatal factors are of importance um, for what we're doing in the delivery room and also for uh, the postnatal care and the uh, uh, final outcome. <clears throat> I would like to share with you <clears throat> some uh, relatively new data from the European um, uh, Electronic Database for uh, preterm babies, the e-newborn. Uh, we published uh, some of these data last year in pediatric research. Um, and this database it contains uh, almost 40,000 babies, preterm babies, less than 32 weeks uh, between born between 2014 <clears throat> and 2016. And here you see um, how the distribution of gestational age is with a <clears throat> peak at 31 weeks. When you look at uh, mortality, we see this beautiful, I say beautiful curve. It's an exponential increase in mortality with decreasing gestational age. And here we have the odds ratios <clears throat> for mortality. Uh, in relation to gestational age. Now, <clears throat> what we also, <clears throat> excuse me, what we also could uh, show was that there is a gender difference regarding survival. And that is not, not a surprise. We've known that for years, uh, but here we can clearly see and demonstrate that uh, girls are doing better than, than males. And also regarding uh, growth retardation, we find that if there is a, a small for gestational age, babies defined as uh, those below the 10th percentile, they have an increased risk of, a modest increased risk of mortality. However, <clears throat> when you're talking about extreme SJAs, less than the third percentile, you see that mortality increases substantially to between four and five um, odds ratio. Now, <clears throat> 10 years ago, ILCOR in their uh, recitation algorithm introduced the term, the golden minute, the first 60 seconds uh, after birth. And that raises a very important question which ILCOR didn't address. And that is, when is the golden minute? And I started to ask people and I started to look into the literature to see when uh, different groups uh, were starting the clock and I got very different um, answers. Some said or wrote that when the shoulders are out we start the clock and some said when the cord is cut and of course that doesn't make any sense today uh, when we are practicing delayed cord clamping. And others said well when the baby is on the recitation table we start the clock and I have to admit in my own practice very often I, I start a clock when the baby was in my hands but the right <clears throat> answer is when the whole baby is out. And this is very important uh, because when you're talking about these golden 60 seconds, we have to know exactly which seconds we are talking about. Also because we are making a, an APCA scoring. So if we look closer at uh, the golden minute, it uh, was split up in, in two halves in 2010. So during the first um, 30 seconds, uh, you're supposed to, to dry the baby, warm it, wrap it in plastic if it's less than 28 weeks. 
stimulate it to breathe if it doesn't breathe and position the airways correctly and also record heart rate and breathing rate. And within the first uh, 60 seconds, the golden minute, you should have initiated respiratory support if that is needed and also put on a pulse oximeter if that is available. Now, is that um, possible to achieve? Well, there are studies from, uh, from uh, Colm O'Donnell's group showing that it's very difficult uh, to achieve that within the golden minute. And we very recently uh, published uh, this um, communication to recitation just a few weeks ago, where we tried to summarize some studies uh, using the Helping Babies Breed project. See, when did I start ventilation? And you see here, these are studies from Tanzania, Uganda, Nepal, and again, Tanzania. And you see there's a wide variation, but if you look at this Pedrovic study from Uganda, they started in mean at 68 seconds, Nepal 71 seconds. It means that it is possible to start the first ventilation uh, around the gold minute, but it's difficult to start uh, uh, within the golden minute. So if we go back to, to this um, delivery room management, I mentioned that other factors uh, are important for, for what we're doing in the delivery room. For instance, the mother's BMI, body mass index, the use of antenatal steroids, as Peter Davis talked about, and also mode of delivery. And just want to show you very briefly um, uh, why this is of importance. So we, we published a, a quite a large meta-analysis in, uh, in Yama some years ago now, where we were able to show that there is a relation between the mother's BMI at the beginning of the pregnancy and perinatal mortality as shown here. <clears throat> and we found exactly the same uh, relation for fetal death and neonatal and infant mortality. So this indicates that it is important that the mother keeps her BMI, let's say, around 25, not too much above that, at least before um, they become pregnant. So this is important for, for us to, to know about. What about the use of antenatal steroids? Now we go back to the e-newborn uh, database. So what we found here was that for babies about 23 weeks, more or less all of them were given steroids, 95%. But not all of them got a complete course. Approximately 20%, <clears throat> a little bit less, <clears throat> got an incomplete course. Does it matter? Well, when we looked at uh, mm, uh, risk of death, we see that there is a clear effect of uh, antenatal steroids. And you see that there is not a big difference between those who got a complete and an incomplete course. And then this tells us that even if you don't have sufficient time to give steroids before 24 hours, before delivery, you should still um, do and give it, uh, I think. Well, mode of birth and neonatal outcome is well known. C-section affects the outcome. And this is a study uh, from Yi and Kovacs some years ago now, six years ago, but it shows that when C-section rate is above 10%, it doesn't affect mortality anymore. So based on this, and we've, when you're talking about mortality, uh, the optimal C-section rate <clears throat> is around 10, maybe up to 15%. Um, of course, when we are talking about morbidities, it could be different. But I think this is important to keep in mind because C-section rate is way too high in most places in the world. And just to remind you that um, after C-section, morbidity is higher. So here we have listed or put up according to gestational age. Um, <clears throat> you see that uh, after C-section, more babies go to the NICU, more TTNs, RDS, CPAP need, and hyperglycemia. And this is, of course, well known, but it's important to keep in mind. <clears throat>
So let's uh, turn to this uh, question. How should we assess heart rate immediately after birth? Well, <coughs> Ilkor in 2015, <coughs> they suggested that the heart rate immediately after birth should be determined by ECG. What about other methods, palpation, auscultation by stethoscope or pulse oximeter? Well, if you look at uh, the relation between uh, heart rate uh, assessed by pulse oximetry and ECG, you find this very nice correlation here. However, you see that some of these babies with a high heart rate, according to ECG, have a low heart rate with the pulse oximeter. So the pulse oximeter seems to underestimate the heart rate uh, for at least some, some of these babies. Kamlin and co-workers and Peter Davis is also a part of this uh, study. Uh, they uh, compared palpation, auscultation with ECG, which is th this line here. And you see that both auscultation and palpation underestimates the heart rate immediately after birth. And this is another study uh, showing that uh, uh, Pulse oximeter, the blue symbols here, also underestimates the heart rate compared to, to ECG, especially in the low um, heart rate uh, um, uh, intervals. So, Camelin and co workers uh, concluded that heart rate by auscultation is inaccurate and uh, underestimates the heart rate obtained by ECG, which I think is, is correct. But uh, together with Roger Sol, we said that we, we wrote a commentary and uh, suggest that instead of counting um, um, uh, heart rate only six seconds, you could count it 10 seconds. And maybe uh, much of this uh, inaccuracy could be eliminated. Well, a reliable heart rate is obtained earlier with ECG than with pulse oximetry. For instance, in one study, it was a difference of 84 seconds, which is substantial. On the other hand, quite a few of these ECG signals so far uh, are excluded due to technical uh, problem. And we also have the problem with pulseless elect electrical um, activity. But fortunately, new devices are under development based on, for instance, Bluetooth technology. <clears throat> and some of these have been tested out already. And I think that we, in the future, will get more accurate methods to assess heart rate. Well, four years ago, Roger Sol and I, we, we wrote this and that auscultation is still the gold standard for assessing heart rate at birth. Uh, it was a kind of a, a criticism of the ILCOR suggestion of ECG, which we, we think was premature at that time. Now, what about suctioning of, of babies? Um, well, already in 2010, Ilkor uh, wrote that routine suctioning for infants born with clear or meconium stain amniotic fluid is no longer recommended. Uh, so I think before that, and when I was in training, we suctioned the babies a lot. And I think the reason we shouldn't suction is um, shown here. And it shows that the saturation, um, oxygen saturation is decreased at least six minutes if you suction routinely compared with no suction. <clears throat> so maybe you don't need to suction, you could just wipe the mouth and the nose with a towel, a cloth, and this is what they tested out in, in a Valle Carlos group um, uh, published in Lancet um, some years ago. Um, the outcome here was a respiratory uh, rate after birth, and you see there's no difference whether you, 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 you wipe or you suction. These are babies about 35 weeks. Station. So I showed these data to our uh, midwives and, and they, they didn't understand, well, we have been wiping for, for years. We have stopped suctioning many years ago. But I still, I think, uh, many places in the world, uh, 
many of the newborns are suction too much. So what is the need of recitation? Again, we can go to this uh, e-newborn database. Um, and what you see here is that for babies, uh, 24 weeks and 25, 26, almost all of them need some kind of resuscitation. And then you see the, the need decreases with uh, gestational age. But we have to distinguish between so-called basic recitation, which is defined as use of bag and mask plus oxygen if needed. And then you see a different picture. You see that the, the most immature ones, they're not recitated with basic recitation, but that the need of that increases, of course, with the gestation age. The smallest one, they need advanced recitation, which is in addition to bag and mask, oxygen, intubation, chest compressions, adrenaline, and probably also volume. Um, very rarely needed though, but, but you see that advanced recitation is very common for the most immature, and then about 30 weeks is not very common anymore. Now, what is the prognosis if a baby needs uh, basic recitation? Well, fortunately, we couldn't find any increase in uh, mortality. However, as soon as a baby needs, needs advanced recitation, uh, mortality is increased approximately twofold. So, so that is um, uh, decreases or reduces the prognosis for, for these babies. A few words about um, sustained um, inflation. Uh, in a rather recent uh, Cochrane review, and Peter Davis also contributed to that one, I think he's contributed to to so many uh, Cochrane reviews in our field. Uh, well, anyway, these authors, they concluded that sustained inflation was not better than intermittent ventilation for reducing mortality. Need for intubation, need for or duration of respiratory support or bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Uh, so there was no evidence of benefit for sustained inflation over intermittent ventilation. However, they found that uh, the duration of mechanical ventilation was shortened in the sustained inflation group, but the authors uh, uh, said that the results should be interpreted with caution. So we need future randomized controlled trials, and, and one such trial was the so-called SAIL study, which uh, was stopped prematurely due to adverse effects, uh, higher mortality in the sustained inflation um, arm. So here is the sales study where babies in the um, in the sustained inflation group received two blows of 15 seconds with a peak pressure of 20 uh, or and 25 seconds. So what I found was that early death was significantly increased from 2.1 to 9.1%. Uh, so that was uh, the reason this study was stopped. And uh, now I'll talk about uh, cord clamping. And that is, uh, has been a hot topic for, for several years now. If you look at how um, blood is transfused from the placenta to, this is to term babies, you see that within 60 seconds, approximately 70% of the blood has been transfused. And that is the reason, if you look into guidelines of, of um, cord clamping, you see that most guidelines say that uh, delayed cord clamping is defined as 30 or 60 seconds um, of um, delay. So here are some um, recommendations from different societies. Um, and you see that 30 to 60 seconds is what is recommended, um, especially for preterm babies. Now, in order to study this, the Australian Placental Transfusion Study, the APT study, was carried out and was published um, a couple of years ago. And in this study, uh, preterm babies born before 30 weeks uh, were 
randomly allocated to immediate cord clamping, that is within 10 seconds after birth, versus delayed cord clamping, 60 seconds or more. And uh, primary outcome was death at 36 weeks of gestation. It was a large study, 1600 babies. So this is what they found regarding the primary outcome, which was death or major morbidity by 36 weeks of postmenstrual age. Absolutely no difference between the groups here, uh, as you can see here. However, when they looked at mortality separately, they found a 30% reduction in mortality in, in the delayed uh, cord clamping group. So these uh, same authors, they carried out um, um, systematic review and meta-analysis, the same field. So uh, babies um, less than 37 weeks, they found uh, studies where babies less than 37 weeks, where they had either been, uh, the cord had been clamped after 30 seconds without cord milking or immediate cord clamping now defined as less than 30 seconds. So this is what I found regarding mortality, the same as in the APT study, a 30% or 32% reduction in mortality if you delay the cord clamping. So, so this was of course a very important uh, study. Secondary outcomes show that delayed clamping reduced the number of blood transfusions uh, needed, but it increased the incidence of polycythemia and also of jaundice. Now, a new aspect of cord clamping I would like to um, emphasize is that late, uh, late clamping increases the saturation. This is from a, a study from Nepal, uh, very recently published and showing that if you delay cord clamping, the saturation up to five, 10 minutes is higher than if you uh, practice early clamping. So if you look at the so-called um, development of oxygen saturation uh, by the Dawson curves, which were published some 10 years ago, um, and compare with, this is the Dawson curves, this is the, the black solid line here, and compare it with what you find uh, after delayed cord clamping, this is from a very recent study from Max Ventus group in Valencia, and it's the blue line here. So you see that uh, the first minutes of life, the saturation is higher uh, after delayed cord clamping. And if you see that those babies uh, who do not reach a saturation of 80%, uh, you see that there are less in the delayed cord clamp group. Uh, although after five minutes, it's not a big difference anymore between the groups. For heart rate, uh, the difference is not very typical. Uh, it's not very substantial, I mean, uh, except for the first maybe minute or so, where the heart rate is higher after delayed cord clamping compared with um, early clamping. Should we resuscitate with an intact cord? This question has been asked uh, now uh, for several years and uh, Kateria and co-workers in San Diego, they carried out the randomized uh, trial babies between 23 and 31 weeks of gestation. And here, you know, this uh, very busy uh, panel, but it's a lot of hemodynamic uh, variables. So to make a long story short, they didn't find any difference in any of these variables, blood pressure, cerebral oxygenation, arterial oxygenation, uh, respiratory rate, etc. So these um, authors concluded that it is possible, it is feasible to uh, ventilate with an intact cord, but there was no measurable clinical improvements according to these data. What about cord milking? Well, you can milk the cord, you cut the cord first at about 25 centimeters from the umbilicus, and you should do that within 30 seconds after birth. And people have said that maybe this is an alternative to waiting for one minute 
before you clamp the cord. You can milk it three times at the speed of 10 centimeters per second. I recently saw a study where they recommended five times milking. Now, cord milking versus immediate cord clamping for immature babies demonstrated uh, a need for le less transfusions in the first 28 days, a higher hematocrit, and also less intraventricular hemorrhage, uh, grade three and four, which, uh, or totally 25 versus 51, grade three and four, was not the big difference. Cord milking versus delayed cord clamping show that it was as efficient. Um, uh, both of them were, seem to be quite equal in this study here. But then Cateria carried out a new study, uh, cord milking versus delayed cord clamping, babies between 23 and 27 weeks um, um, of age. And what you see here is that the cord milking group had a significantly higher risk for severe interventricular hemorrhage. So what happens is that when you're milking the cord, um, the increased venous return to the right atrium enters uh, the aorta. Uh, as you know, there's a pulmonary vasoconstriction, so it goes up to the brain and lack of cerebral autoregulation and right to left ductal shunt result in fluctuations in flow to an immature brain with fragile germinal matrix. And this may be the mechanism for increased the risk of interventricular hemorrhage. Now, Katera did a follow-up to make this more complicated follow-up of his data. And he actually found a higher cognitive score after cord milking. But still, I think most of us would say we don't want to, to recommend cord milking for these immature babies because of the risk of uh, interventricular hemorrhage. And now these days, uh, uh, people are talking about physiological cord clamping. You should ventilate and then cut the cord. And this um, concept have, has been um, um, taught us a lot from Stuart Hooper in, uh, in Melbourne. And this is from one of his uh, animal experiments showing that if you cut the cord before you start ventilation, you get this increase in arterial pressure. If you wait to ventilate, uh, wait to clamp the cord after ventilation, you get this more smooth transition. Um, so um, today, I think more and more are suggesting that we should use this more physiological approach. Just finally, a few words about heat loss and temperature control. Now, Ilkor emphasizes this uh, a lot. And, and in the 2015 algorithm, they introduced this temperature line just to remind us that we should maintain the temperature throughout the whole procedure in the delivery room. So for the smallest babies, in order to prevent heat loss, we, we put them into plastic. We wrap them or put them into plastic bags. And um, here is a Cochrane review um, published a couple of years ago, showing that, yes, by doing that, uh, you keep the body temperature at a more uh, uh, correct level, as shown here. Uh, and also, uh, later on during stabilization, uh, the temperature is, uh, is kept in, in, within the, um, the interval we, we want to keep them. However, when we look at more uh, important outcome measures, brain injury, there's no difference whether you, you wrap into plastic or not. And when you look at uh, mortality, again, there's no difference. So if you wrap babies 28 weeks or less into plastic, it leads to higher temperature at admission with less hypothermia. But you have to remember that you should be very careful with this because it might induce iatrogenic hyperthermia, uh, particularly if you're also using thermal mattresses. Uh, 
together with um, putting me into plastic. Um, this Cochrane review concluded that there is limited evidence um, to suggest any benefit and no evidence of harms for most short-term morbidity outcomes known to be associated with hypothermia. Many observational studies have shown increased mortality among preterm hypothermic infants, yet evidence is insufficient to suggest these interventions reduce risk of in-hospital mortality. Hypothermia may be a marker for illnesses and poorer outcome by association rather than by causality. Should we stop putting these babies into plastic or wrap them into plastic? I don't think so. I think we should still should do that because even if this Cochrane review didn't show any major difference in, in major outcome measures, I think we should strive to keep these babies in the uh, thermoneutral um, interval. So here are the recommendations, the European recommendations from 2006 to 2019. Keep the babies the, the core temperature between 36.5 and 37.5. American Academy of Pediatrics uh, recommends babies less than 32 weeks, the delivery room temperature should be 23 to 25. And uh, recitation guidelines re recommend babies less than 28 weeks, a temperature of 26 degrees. The obstetricians think that's too hot, I think and uh, objects to that. And very finally, I just want to show you um, guidelines from World Health Organization 2015, where they advocate kangaroo mother care. It should be promoted. And even intermittent kangaroo um, mother care is, uh, is of, um, um, of use and, and should be um, promoted, I think. So I'll end up with um, the delivery room stabilization recommendations from, from Europe, published a year ago. And they in these uh, recommendations, we suggest uh, or recommend delayed cord clamping for at least 60 seconds. We haven't introduced physiological cord clamping yet, but I guess perhaps in the new edition coming out in um, 2022, uh, this will be introduced. Often I talked about in the, the first lecture, um, it should be controlled by using a blender. An initial FO2 of 30% is appropriate for babies less than 28 weeks gestation. I have to add that it might, maybe it should be higher, maybe 40%, we don't know. 21 to 30% for those between 28 and 31 weeks and adjustments guided by pulse oximetry. CPAP, I didn't talk about that, but we recommend a CPAP of six to nine centimeter. Water via mask or nasal prongs. We do not recommend sustained inflation. And we also recommend that intubation should be reserved for babies who have not responded to positive pressure ventilation via face mask. Plastic bags or occlusive wrapping under radiant warmers should be used during stabilization in the delivery suite for babies less than 28 weeks gestation to reduce the risk of hypothermia. So here in this final slide kind of summarizes um, some of the topics I have discussed in this lecture. So here is about um, umbilical cord um, uh, clamping, Summarizing the Australian placental transfusion trial, here is Cateria trials, uh, cord milking summarized. Here we have summarized some of the uh, studies regarding use of oxen by Owe and Covix from Sydney. And here's the SAIL trial and the Neoprom trials, which I talked about um, previously. So thank you so much for your attention.